Good morning. Thank you for registering for the ongoing Fluid Life Data Interpretation Webinar Series. Uh, each webinar will focus in on a specific component covering overall causes of potential issues and then looking at the oil analysis data to identify the key indicators and how to react to them. If you have any questions during or after these sessions, please feel free to send them to myself or email customercare at fluidlife.com and a Fluid Life team member will get back to you promptly. Uh, these sessions will also be recorded and available on fluidlife.com for you to listen to after this session. I'm Mohabib, a camp manager for oil and gas, and I'll be your host today. This session will focus on reducers. Before we get started, let's take, talk a little bit about the data interpretation process. If you really think about it, it can be broken up into three parts. The first is the interpretation of the results, which is reviewing what has been flagged, reviewing the hours on the oil or component, and looking into recent repairs or issues which could have driven these flags and getting additional perspective from the lab, the OEM, the oil supplier, and other sources to determine how to react. The next step is you take this information and decide how or if you're going to react. You make the call. This leads to your response, ranging from not doing anything uh, to monitoring more closely or even creating an improvement project. So let's begin with an overview of reducers. So what is a gear reducer anyways? In the world of mechanical power transmission, there are a lot of moving parts and things can get complicated quickly. A very important part of these systems are the gearboxes. The gear reducers help to modify the torque and the speed between a motor and a load. So what are the different types of gear reducers? There are four main types of gear reducers, planetary, worm gear, gear train, and bevel gear reducers. Each reducer has its advantages and its disadvantages. So when should you use a planetary gear reducer? Well, planetary gearboxes are compact. Uh, the advantages of a planetary gearbox include the compact size, high efficiency, low clearance, and high torque to weight ratio. But due to their design, they require very specialized maintenance. Uh, when should you use a worm gear reducer? Worm gear reducers are generally used for applications requiring very high transmission ratios. The mechanism of worm gear reducers is non-reversible. This means that the worm wheel cannot drive the worm. The advantage of this non-reversible mechanism is that it ensures a greater level of security for the system. Uh, worm gear reducers are less expensive than planetary gearboxes and are also quieter. Uh, like planetary gearboxes, Worm gear reducers heat up quickly due to how compact they are and are also very high variable, variable performance levels. Uh, these are generally used for conveyors, uh, winches, and handling. Uh, with a gear train reducer, they're generally used for applications requiring a lot of power, uh, like conveyors. Uh, the simplicity of the technology allows you to save on maintenance costs. And additionally, the gear train gear reducers have a very high performance level. And they also have a low reduction ratio per gear train. Uh, and finally, when should you use a bevel gear reducer? Bevel gear redu reducer's main characteristic is their angular bell crank. Uh, this allows the user to change the mach machine's rotation system. Uh, they're very compact, robust, and can handle a lot of power. Uh, they're also very quiet. They offer high performance levels and are super energy efficient. Uh, the bevel gear reducers are generally used for high-powered conveyors, but also for mobile machinery used in agricultural or public works. Gearboxes are found in all industries, in aggregate processing, agriculture, chemical processing, oil and gas, transmission, distribution system, logistics, warehouses, and storage, just to name a few. Uh, gear reducers are also commonly found in areas where higher torque and or lower rotational speed is needed or if power needs to be transmitted at an alternative angle, such as at a right angle to the motor. It's also possible to change the rotational direction as well, going from clockwise to counterclockwise. What can cause a failure in a gear reducer? So mechanical failures are a concern with any application, because when systems not operating, it ultimately results in lost productivity and by extension money. So what causes failures? 
Like all rotating equipment, there are many potential reasons for breakdowns in downtime, but it usually comes down to one of two issues. Improper sizing of application or failure to maintain the equipment. Uh, as shown here, 34.4% uh, of common failures are due to inadequate lubrication, 19.6% uh, of contamination, and 17.7% uh, are due to installation errors, and a smaller 6.9% to overload, and then 2.8% is handling errors. So oil analysis falls under the umbrella of equipment maintenance. So let's take a look at some common problems in reducers. There are three common problems with gear reducers. The first is heating and oil leakage. And the second is gear wear. And the third is bearing damage. In order to improve efficiency, some reducers, in particular worm gear reducers, use non-ferrous metals. Uh, due to the sliding friction, this can cause high quantity of heat, which can cause the oil to thin, uh, thereby causing leakage. This is where the oil you choose comes into play. A hotter operating temperatures require lubricants with higher viscosity numbers because as the oil warms, its ability to resist flow decreases. So here's a breakdown of the most basic and comprehensive testing. As you can see here, the basic testing covers wear metals, viscosity, the presence of water, oxidation, and acid number. While this gives a great 500,000 foot view of what's going on in your reducer, the more advanced testing can help you dig deeper into results by doing things like particle counts and ferrography. Uh, so let's take a look at an analysis report. Let's start with the wear metal analysis as tested by the ICP. A spectrochemical analysis measures the level of wear metals and concentration of the additive elements. Uh, these are reported in ppm or parts per million and provide an indication of the rates of wear of engine components and the depletion of additives. Uh, there are three things to keep in mind. Wear particles analyzed are generally limited to 5 to 6 micron, which would indicate that particles that are a result of wear, but it won't tell you the cause of the wear. Uh, in order to get your reliable data using SPEC, you should run at least three samples to establish a wear trend. And finally, each component is its own wear fingerprint. That means that the data collected is essential in verifying if there are any possible issues. Uh, as you can see here, there's a high amount of iron, tin, chromium, and nickel wear. This can be indicative of a bearing or a gear tooth wear. There's also elevated sodium and potassium, which is due to contamination from an outside source. Uh, for example, you'll find if there's a potash, if there's potash, there'll be higher levels of sodium and uh, potassium. Generally, the viscosity is a key indicator in your oil analysis. This test should ideally be performed at 40 and 100 degrees Celsius. An increase in the viscosity can indicate conditions such as oil thickening, increased contamination levels, or increase in insolubles. A reduction in the viscosity can be indicative of dilution in the oil. So the first thing you want to do if the viscosity readings are high and there are no other flags to confirm the oil is labeled correctly. A mislabeled oil can provide incorrect data and cause false flags. The next thing you should do is take a resample. This would confirm if there was, in fact, an issue and not contributed to things like improper sampling techniques or sample contamination. So I picked this sample because it appears that there's no issues in the viscosity. And if you notice in the sample, even with the high metal wear, such as the iron, cotton, chromium, and nickel, uh, it's, the viscosity is not reflective. So this is where more comprehensive test of can, testing can provide a deeper dive into the equipment. As you can see here, when we expand our results out, the optical particle classification, or OPC, tells a bigger story. Uh, but before we look at the results, let's take a look at what OPC is. So as ICP can only track particles up to five microns, the OPC is able to track bigger particles. It combining particle counting and classification, it can also classify them into their respective types of wear. Uh, think of it almost like a mini ferrography. By sorting the particles into the following families, cutting, fatigue, sliding, non-metallic, and fibrous wear, the OPC can determine the source of the contamination. So let's, uh, let's go back to look at that sample now. So in this sample, you can see the particle count is quite high. This wasn't reflected in the viscosity due to the particles settling out. 
it, it would not have been detected by the ICP if they were bigger than five microns. As we go further into the report, you can see the breakdown by particle size as well as by type of wear. Uh, the table on the bottom left gives you a picture of what's going on. Um, it can give you a picture of what's going on based on the wear, and this is supplemented by a trending graph on the right. As you can see here, the wear is broken down by classification. So you have the fibrous wear can be due to filters or outside contamination, such as fibers from a white rag. Uh, the cutting wear is due to abrasive metals scraping the material away. Uh, sliding wear is indicative of lubrication film provided by the oil wearing out and causing direct metal to metal contact. The cutting and sliding wear flags go back to the iron, tin, chromium, and nickel flags that are picked up by the ICP. Uh, the fatigue wear is the long, slow wear, and the non metal wear can be brought back to outside contamination such as sodium and potassium which can be seen in the sample results. Basically, the OPC helps tell the entire story. So with this particular sample, the customer actually decided to dive even deeper into the root of the problem by performing an analytical ferrography. So analytical ferrography is an advanced particle study method to identify wear particle types, and also helps you identify the wear mode that generate these particles. It also provides a detailed analysis of the wear particles, contaminants, and lubrication degradation. Uh, there are certification courses that are required in order to properly interpret the analytical ferrography data appropriately. Uh, everyone at Flu Life who runs the ferrography is trained um, to is certified in order to interpret this data appropriately. Uh, so whereas the OPC breaks up the wear into five groups, the ferrography goes into more detail and can provide information such as corrosive, laminar, normal, and severe wear, as well as let you know what type of contaminants are present. So after performing this testing slate, combined with their vibration data, the reducer was scheduled for a changeout and the sampling frequency was increased uh, until they felt confident enough to resume the original testing program. So this brings us to the end of the, today's webinar. Uh, for more information, and for any questions or inquiries, please email customercare at fluidlife.com and we'll make sure to get back to you promptly. I thank you again for attending today's session.